So there's this photo going around from South Korea. I think there's this boy in this giant plastic bubble in the middle of a baseball game. He's high-fiving all these baseball players and he's throwing the first pitch of the game. All in the name of social distancing. And it's really safe being in this giant plastic bubble. It looks really fun as well. I was imagining doing this in football. You could literally be the ball. Well, today's sermon is entitled Bubble Boy Jesus. We're all in this plastic bubble and we put Jesus in his own plastic bubble. And this is a kind of a safe way, a comfortable way of being a Christian. But the trouble begins when someone invades my bubble or I step outside of my comfort zone. And this is what happens three times in today's passage in John chapter 12. We see this happening with Mary, with Judas, and with the chief priests in today's message entitled Bubble Boy Jesus. Stick around. So the passage we are looking at is John chapter 12 and the setting is Jesus is having a meal in his honor. Six days before the Passover, another meal. Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now in the previous chapter, Jesus raised this guy, his name is Lazarus, from death to life again. This is a miracle. Verse 2, they have a dinner to thank Jesus for this miracle. So here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Lazarus had a sister, her name was Martha. She served the food on the table. She probably cooked most of the food there. Hopefully she was a good cook. Lazarus, he had another sister and her name was Mary. Verse 3. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard. What's that? An expensive perfume and she poured it on Jesus' feet and she wiped his feet with her hair. And it says the house was filled with the fragrance of his feet. No, of the perfume that Mary poured on Jesus' feet. That's incredible. So the first bubble that we see, I need a bubble. So the first bubble that we see is Mary. You see, Martha had it right. She cooked dinner for Jesus, served him food. That's an acceptable way, very British way, of thanking someone for doing all a good thing. But Mary, she goes way outside the norms by pouring this perfume, it says they're a very expensive perfume. Later on, we find out it's a year's wages, about 18, 20,000 pounds worth of perfume on Jesus' feet. She wiped his feet with her hair. See, that's just unusual. That's just weird. No friends. That is worship. Worship is essentially giving to Jesus not what we have, but what he is worth. And to Mary, he is worth everything. Bubble number two is Judas Iscariot, Jesus' friend, who later on betrays him. And this is verse four. But one of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, object. And he says, verse five, why wasn't this perfume sold, the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Judas is an interesting Jesus disciple, but also as one who betrays him. And those two things kind of like don't quite go together. Like your friend who is also your enemy, the student who thinks he's better than the teacher. And that's Judas Iscariot. He's a very conflicted guy. And you see this conflict happening between him and Mary. Because you see, on the one hand, Judas, he's a thief. He used to steal money from the money back. But on the other hand, it is a really interesting thing. He goes outside of the norms by making Mary feel bad about doing something good. Here's something who wants to feel good about doing something bad, but he does it by making someone who's doing good, making them feel bad about doing that good thing. Oh, this money should be given to the poor. Everyone's thinking, oh, you're such a good guy, Judas. He makes someone who is doing good feel really, really bad. And that's his strategy. He puts people down by making himself feel better about himself. Bubble number three is the teachers of the law. And this is verse, what verse is it? Uh, verse number nine. Now I know that uh, we're skipping over a few verses here. We'll come back to what Jesus says to Judas. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews uh, found out that Jesus was there and came and not only because of him, because of Jesus, but also it says to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So pay attention to verse 10. So the chief priests 
made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For an account of him, many of the Jews are going to Jesus and putting their faith in him. Now notice that Jesus, now notice that Jesus is all the way over here, but these chief priests, they're all the way over there. You know, they, they're, they're far away. They're not even at the dinner party, but they're making plans to kill Jesus. Why? Because to them, my bubble is the most important bubble. You know, you guys need to come over to me. If you're not coming over to me, you're going over to him. You're my enemy. You know, I hate you. You know, my bubble is the most important bubble. You know, my world, my space, my influence, it's all about me. It can never be about Jesus. And if you do go over to him, you're toast. What's the third bubble? It's self-importance. What it's saying is the center of our bubbles. It's actually our hearts. It's where I am God. I am the center of my universe. That's a very dangerous way, but a very common way of thinking. You know, all that jealousy, all that frustration, all that worry about things that are happening inside my bubble is a reflection of all that the chief priests are going through. Let's pull it all together and see how it applies to our lives today. Look at Mary, looking at Judas, looking at Judas, and also looking at the chief priests. And looking at Mary, we learn a lot about worship, extravagant, generous worship. And Jesus says a lot more about it in verse seven. Leave her alone, Jesus replies to Judas. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you. You will not always have me. What is Jesus doing? Well, he's comparing her worship with his sacrifice on the cross. Mary doesn't know this yet, but a week from now, Jesus is going to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And this over-the-top sacrifice that God gave his son for the sins of the world, for my sins and your sins, Jesus compares that with what Mary does here. It seems too much, but Jesus says, that's what I'm going to do for you on the cross. Well, that's one thing. But another thing he says that's really curious, verse 8, he says, you always have the poor among you. And he says that there's this good thing that you could do. You could give the money to the poor, but he says, you won't always have me. What's Jesus saying about that? You know, that opportunity to go over the top for Jesus, to go worship him with everything that you have, it doesn't come every day. It's a special, special opportunity, special blessing that God gives you to be able to do this. And when that opportunity comes, go for it. I think that's what Jesus is saying. There's always going to be someone who says, you know, maybe you should wait. There's always going to be someone, some voice inside of you that says, you know, maybe this is too much. But when it comes to God, when it comes to Jesus, that opportunity to give him your life in response to his sacrifice towards you and thanks towards him, go for it. That's the first thing with Mary. Secondly, with Judas, what do we learn from Judas of all people? Well, we learn one thing that betrayal <laughs> Sorry about the noise. We learned that betrayal, it starts small. Judas, he didn't become this betrayer overnight. He was still conflicted on the inside. The word there for betray is actually the word for handing over from one hand to the other. It's kind of like when you order something on Deliveroo. I heard that KFC is open now. You could order KFC and it would be delivered to you. And a person would arrive at the door and he would hand the Kentucky Fried Chicken, the package, over to you. And that's all that Judas did. He didn't kill Jesus himself, didn't nail him to the cross, but he handed him over to someone who did. And you see, for Judas, it was always that small step, that small sin, that small excuse to take that money, to do that sin, to think that thought that led him ultimately to betraying Jesus Christ, to betraying his friend, betraying his Lord. Betrayal starts out small. Temptation always looks good in the beginning, and by the time it looks bad, it's often too late. Finally, with the chief priests, we've seen that they're self-absorbed. Anyone who goes over to Jesus, they'll, they'll kill them. But you know, I want us to look at Lazarus because the chief priests make plans not so much to kill Jesus, they plan to kill Lazarus. Now, Lazarus is a very, very interesting guy because he says nothing at all throughout the entire chapter, nothing at all throughout the entire Bible. You know, he was raised from the dead, he was silent. He's here at this dinner party and what's he doing? Eating food. You know, at least Mark Martha, you know, she's serving Mary, she goes over the top. But Lazarus, what does he do? He is stuffing his face. But you know, I find that encouraging. We're not all Marys, we're not all Martha, but we can be close to Jesus. That's all he did. He hung out with Jesus. And because of him, verse 9, a large crowd of Jews came close to Jesus. He became a magnet. All you need to do is to have this relationship and people will be drawn, maybe not to you, but to Jesus. 
And that's enough to have some people hate you, like the chief priests, but that's also enough for you to draw men and women to Christ to see what He has done for you, risen you from the dead, offering them that same gift of eternal life, of friendship with God, of forgiveness of sins. Well, thank you so much for watching and thank you so much if you made it this far. Take care. God bless. Oh